y'all doing? We're smoking reefer. And you don't want no part of this. Smoking reefer? Yeah, yeah. 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 Smoking reefer
her ring. I had to, um, you know, cleanse, clean the palate. It's not like I had to wipe away a bunch of knowledge and sort of performance choices that I did as Saul. Because Saul was this very, uh, he was a presentation. He, he said in the first time you see him, look, I, this isn't who I am. My name is Saul. And my name is not Saul. Jimmy, James McGill. I'm, this is a front. This is the whole thing's a front. But it's very easy to play a person one way at their office and then go, okay, now we're going to take that guy, he's going to walk into this house, and there's his brother who's sick. A group of wealthy men being told they are not allowed to use mayonnaise. I beg to differ. No. What? Show me. Show me where it says that. So, when I was in uh, junior high school, we had this assignment. Okay. And I remember classmates just coming up with really boring, just awful things that they would do, you know, visit their family and stuff like that. I'm like, last day on earth. And I just, I don't know if I was trying to be funny or what, but I wrote that, oh, if it's my last day alive, I'd go down to the main street of Valley Street in New York, where I grew up, and I'd just destroy everything. I'm smashing windows, <laughs> light stores on fire. I thought it was great. And then I didn't get a grade on it. But the teacher was like, can you see me after class? And she had this talk with me and then sent me to the school psychologist. And so I felt immediately like I was in trouble, but not even for me. I felt like I was in trouble. One of the things I can think about about the movie is that it's all about vulnerability. Like, the more you're able to be vulnerable to whatever it is in the world, you know, we put all these things in, you know, we, we have to. You know, every one of us has a different thing and a million different things that we use and whatever. 
and to be an adult. That sense of vulnerability to see who you really are. I think that's what we want. You know, it's like, I, I would hope we all want to be able to be open with each other. I think there's part of it in me where I kind of recognize the absurdity of what I'm doing and the only way that I can move past the absurdity of it is to commit to it in a place where no one can say that it's absurd anymore. I have this strong belief in the unconscious that it is driving us. It's like this massive river that we're floating on and we're sort of unaware, obviously, sometimes of where we're going. I don't think we have much control over it because that brings in the question of like fate, destiny, and free will. But I believe that there's a way in which you can kind of hop onto as a, as a performance, as an actor, like onto another river a little bit. If you work hard enough, you kind of like move your unconscious into a space. There were a, like three months where I just did absolutely had no idea what to do next and the most scary worry was after about a month of it I didn't care and I didn't know what to do next. I was just gonna I was I was trying to make myself this painless android. What happens is then that if if you keep running into people like that their job in life is to infect you so that they don't have to keep doing that and then you get that voice. And then they and then they won. So all the times that you keep doubting yourself, what you're doing is you let some dull, uncreative, uncreative person in your path, you're letting them win when you let that voice win. You've let someone in your path, and if you really sit and do it, so like opinionated and we're, we're so different in a lot of ways but like having that in the house is like a foil you know I think I was like well I'm this and then I'm just gonna be this to like the extreme the good and bad thing about like how my personality just is I have nothing to do with it it's like I'm pretty good at a lot of stuff right because I like to to have a lot of different things to focus on. Sometimes I, I wonder if like there is like, a quantitative thing where like part of, you know, like all my things suffer. I was talking to a friend about what you want to accomplish in every decade of your life. And I think like I certainly in my teens and my early 20s like just wanted to be cool. And then in my later, mid to late 20s, I wanted to be around really smart people. And in my 30s, I found myself 
being attracted to like incredibly talented people. And as I get in my later 30s, I want to be around like kind people. But it's like I was in a bubble. It was like I was in a submarine. Because I was, you know, in the writer's room, in the edit room, I was on the stage. So now it just ends. And it's like you come out of this submarine and you're like, this is where I live? You know, you're like, my kids are 12? <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's really a weird feeling. But there's also excitement. Because now you have all this, you have time, you got money now, you got a little bit of fame, whatever. This is going to be cool. Let's see what happens. You're transmitting. They still have a signal on you. Your collar, your belt, your zipper. Get rid of your clothes, all of them. Well, then what am I supposed to do? Nothing. If you live another day, I'll be very impressed. You have something they want! I don't have anything! Maybe you do and you don't know it. You stay away from Rachel, you stay away from me. You come near either one of us, I'm gonna kill you. sitting on a winning lottery ticket. Too much of a pussy to cash it in. And that's bullshit. Because I'd do fucking anything to have what you got. So would any of these fucking guys. It'd be an insult to us if you're still here in 20 years. I think that at times he hates my guts, but I think deep down he admires me because he sees a lot of him and me. I don't take crap from no one. I'm an individual and I didn't even take crap from him. That's why we separated. He wanted to control my marketing and I wouldn't let him. One day I remember uh, laying on the basement floor. My heart felt like it was coming out of my chest. I had two or three empty bottles of whiskey around me. I remember just laying there, looking around, and I'm like, wow, you, you are pathetic. Are you kidding? I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I don't know if I said it out loud or just in my head. I had a little bit more room in the pocket. And I remember going up to her and saying, I'm going to do the rest of this. Yep, I'm going to do all this right now. I'm going to do it one time. And if I get to it, I'm done completely. Never do. If I die, that's you know, I mean it's probably better off. It won't be better off without me. I think I think that at times
I did nothing. I, I just let her walk out of the party, and I didn't say anything to her. And now, now she, she's gone forever. She's my soulmate. Can you don't think it's dangerous to use the term soulmate? It implies there's some magical element that we have no control over, like fate or destiny. I can't be able to believe like that. It stops us doing the real work. And the fact is, if your therapy here stays on track, I think you'll find there are many, many people. trying to mix humor and drama and happiness and sadness and everything all together because uh, uh, I've never met anybody that feels one way at every, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's like you're, it's just you're comprised of many different feelings all at once. And, uh, extreme level try to portray that. I feel like life is a mixture of things. That's why I'm always intrigued by the tone of things. Where you try to mix humor and drama. 